Good morning, church. Very, very excited that you all are here today and very excited that the choir is here behind us. No one holds a candle to this choir. They sing from their soul and their heart and they are good, so thank you. Today we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, so if you're watching this live on video, just pause it for a second or run out and get to your um, bread and juice or wine, it's kind of early for that, but if not, you can use your bagel and coffee. Just be prepared to take communion with us when it's communion time. We really want to include you in this later in the service. Will you now please join me in the call to worship? Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him Praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance, praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Will you please join me as we stand together and sing, In Christ there is no east or west. Sunday when we gather together we have a time to reflect to confess our, our sins and be assured of God's forgiveness so if you haven't done anything wrong this week if you haven't missed the mark at all if you haven't thought evil thoughts or covetous thoughts or any of those things don't worry about the prayer I'm sure we'll all join together in the prayer of confession <laughs> I know I need it. Will you please pray with me as printed in your bulletin and above in the screens. Holy Father, forgive us. Though you should guide us, we inform ourselves. Though you should rule us, we control ourselves. Though you should fulfill us, we console ourselves. For we think your truth is too high or will be too hard, your power too remote or love too free but they are not, and without them we are of all people most miserable. Heal our confused mind with your word. Heal our divided will with your law. Heal our troubled conscience with your love. Heal our anxious hearts with your presence, all for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. Let us continue silently just to speak to God about those things in our life that we want to make right with God. Amen. Hear now these words of assurance. 
Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace we have been saved. Good morning, church. I asked the pastor if it would be okay to uh, share with you just a statistic that I heard of today. So first of all, happy Labor Day (laughs) weekend. Uh, And this is the statistic. As of July 7th, 2023, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the labor participation for women is 77.8%. That is, from all the people in the United States who are pulling down a paycheck, from the youngest to the oldest, 77.8% of them are women. About time to, (laughs) it's about time to get rid of that pay gap, I think. (laughs) And I'd like to just, Uh, mention on behalf of the congregation that we're certainly glad there's a woman, uh, our Pastor Jan, as a part of those statistics. We're so grateful for you being our interim pastor. Um, There's a couple of announcements that are not in the bulletin that I'd like to mention first. Halloween is coming up, so start a school, so it's time to get ready with your cars and your candy for trunk or treat. So get ready for that. And also uh, the children's Christmas pageant is coming up December 17th and rehearsals will start sometime this month. So please uh, pay attention and we'll keep you posted. Okay, and some um, more announcements to highlight. Next Sunday is Deacon Sunday. And we're looking forward to a message being brought by uh, Kyle DiCamello. They'll be also hosting the fellowship hour, so let's be sure to support the deacons next Sunday. Presbyterian women of the San Diego Presbytery Fall Gathering is September 22nd from 9.30 
a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Chula Vista Presbyterian Church. For more information, see Ardell. The Crafty Ladies will be gathering September 26th from 11.30 to 2 p.m. at Carol Foster's house. Carol, there she is. <laughs> Um, George Walker Smith Education Campus dedication is Wednesday, September 27, 2023, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Central Elementary School at George Walker Smith Educational Campus on at 3878 Orange Avenue. Let's support this wonderful endeavor. And our annual blessing of the animals will be October 1st at 1 p.m. This is the nearest feast day for uh, St. Francis of Assisi. So please get your pets groomed and ready for the blessing. And now a word from our Lord. Today's reading is from the prophet Hosea. God's compassion despite Israel's ingratitude. Chapter 11, verses one through nine. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called him, them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities. It consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemers. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Holy wisdom, holy word. Good morning, church. Before the world was made, you were a part of me, 
an extension of my thoughts, a perfect idea of beauty. You were and are my child, and there is no step I would not have taken to save you, to rescue you, and to show you that I will never leave or forsake you. My love and commitment to you is steadfast and sustained by a covenant seal of my son's blood. The invitation is always open for you to know me, to be with me, and experience my love. I want to be with you for all of eternity. This world will bring you sorrow. This world will bring you pain. This world will bring you disappointments. But my love for you will remain. Jesus, I 
our teeth on growing up. Am I right? There we go. Let us now turn to the gospel according to Luke chapter 15 verses 1 through 3 and 1 through 32. If you follow your bulletin you will see that I have made two errors this week. The first is that we did not read from Hosea 9, Hosea 11, which is the text that I intended. And we're going through verse 32, not 31, as in your bulletin. Just so you know, Full disclosure here. I realized that last night, Purnell and BJ are like, one more email from Pastor Jan. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Let us now hear the word of the Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. And then beginning in verse 11. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in extravagant living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he sent off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you and before 
against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. They began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is mine. All that and all that is mine is yours. Holy wisdom, holy word. Will you please pray with me? Lord, we ask that you would give us new insights, new eyes, a heart of compassion and an acceptance of one who would show himself to be a symbol of a shepherd, a woman, and a father. Let my words reflect your message of costly love and help us embrace that love in the hearing of your word and in the breaking of the bread. In Christ we pray. Amen. So we get this, I'm not even sure how we get this goofy magazine, but it's called Ranch and Coast. And it's for people who have a heck of a lot more money than almost this entire congregation put together, I'm sure, I being one of them. They had this advertisement in there that said, fighting for your rightful inheritance. I'm like, what's wrong with that picture? Fighting for your rightful inheritance? Is that inheritance a gift? Is that inheritance something that a, a parent or somebody else chooses to give? So when we think about it, what do you leave your children? My parents, who um, worked very, very hard, they grew up in simple beginnings. Um, my mother was a teacher, my father was a civil engineer. They grew up during the Depression, so if you're anywhere close to that, every penny counted, every penny was saved. You just, you had Plymouth station wagons. Anyone remember that car? You know, you didn't have cat, you didn't do any of that. You were very frugal. And when my father wrote with my mother the um, will or living trust or whatever it was, um, there was no expectation really that there would be anything in it, but they wrote it. And one thing that my father had in there was that if there's any disagreement with any of the children, they're cut off immediately. There we go. I have a, a friend who had a family of several children, and even though that there was a um, will, it wasn't much, they began to fight. And to this day, a number of them are not speaking to one another. We get so caught up in thinking we deserve whatever it is that really is not ours, it's a gift. This story is a lot about that. The culture is a little bit different. It's about uh, an arrogant loser, a goody two-shoes, and what looks to be an overindulgent father. There is no repentance in this story. There is no repentance in this story. So one of the things I want to do today is just set us up. We're going to come back to this in a couple of weeks and spend a couple of more weeks on this. It's rich. It's worth looking at. One of the things we really need to do is to look at it in the eyes of the community to which Jesus was speaking. Otherwise, we won't understand it. So there's no ending to the story either. It just kind of hangs there. We'll be here, as I say, in the next couple of weeks, but I want to bridge a little bit of Old Testament history with what Jesus is doing here when he's talking to the disciples. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard the term um, 
wait till dad gets home, wait till your father gets home. Well, considering Rick is 6'2 and about 100 pounds more than I am, that made perfect sense to me when the kids were not obeying me, which was often, I would, uh, and Rick would tell you once what you needed to do, I would give you three times and that would kind of expand, so there you go. But this is about a different kind of dad, different than any of us can expect. And the reading from Harriet earlier says it best in verse um, 9 of chapter 11. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, no human, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Again, keeping that in mind when you look at the story. That is an Old Testament text that tells us about how Jesus operates with his Father, so familiar story. It is called a parable. If remember in verses one through three, Jesus said, so he told this parable. What are they arguing about? You are not only hanging with sinners, you are eating with them. You didn't eat with sinners. Remember that when we come to the communion table that Jesus has invited us to. He eats with us. And so he has this idea that Jesus wants them to understand, and it's one parable in three parts. So the lost sheep, the lost coin, and now the two lost sons. Sheep, one in a hundred. Coin, one in ten. Brothers, I would say it's ten for ten. What would you say? Or one for one. They're both lost. They both need redemption. Jesus is both the shepherd, the woman, and the father. So this is what I'd like to do in the next few minutes, is just look at this parable and the stories and talk about, again, the duty of the Pharisees were to observe the law. That's what they did. And they could eat amongst the commoners, amongst the non-super religious people because they never ate with them. See, that's why they come to Jesus. Why are you eating with them? I mean, you can, you can maybe walk alongside them, but you don't sit at table with them. So they're asking that. The scribes come into play with the way in which Jesus takes a story, and this story that's familiar, but he uses it with a much more familiar story. He's called a rabbi in the story, and that's also important. So as he begins to tell the story about the two sons, what should come in mind, especially for the scribes, is a story of Esau, Jacob. Think about this just in the terms of the, you have the patriarch, you have a father and he has two sons. The younger son wants the inheritance, and both of them finagle it. Both of them go to their father. So when Jacob goes to his father, and you can find all this in, um, if you want to go back and look in Genesis, I think it begins in chapter 8, well, 23 maybe. Excuse me, I want to get the right, I don't, oh, 27. Here you have the same illustration, the same story, and they would understand that. See, part of the way in which we understand stories or tell it is what's familiar. So he has the two sons. One wants the inheritance. They both want it. They both do it underhandedly. The younger son takes off, as did Jacob. Now, Jacob left rich. He, he came back poor. Or he came, I'm sorry, he left poor. He actually had to get out of Dodge, as they would say, because his brother had found out his brother hated him. Oh, the older brother. And the story of the parable. Hates what his younger brother has done. So from poverty, Jacob leaves. He comes back wealthy, young son, except he doesn't quite get back. Someone goes to meet him. And the other one, the parable of the lost son, he leaves rich and he comes back poor. You have the similarity. He takes what we understand and he puts it into the context and so he's doing that for that. 
It is a divine incarnation theme also. Think of it this way, Jacob, the angel comes. Luke, the father, is a divine figure. It is a gospel within a gospel. So as the angel comes, he wrestles, there's a physical presence here, he wrestles with Jacob. The father and the, and the prodigal son embraces, he touches. All those things are important in understanding what does this mean to me culturally? How is this happening to me? It's a foundational story that takes the community to a new level, and that's what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to get them to understand it's more than just what you think it is and the laws. It's about a relationship with God and what does God do. And we see that story in Jacob and Esau, so when you go home this afternoon, I encourage you to go back to Genesis and start reading that story and look for the similarities there. It is a experience of how we fail in wanting what we want more than what God wants. How we think we need to either help God or manipulate or do whatever it is to get what we want to go. And God again says, I'm not going to destroy that. So in the beginning of this parable, you have the two sons. And as we look at this next week, we'll go over some of this again, but the son comes to his dad, the younger son, and says to his father, I want the inheritance now. I mean, even now, if we said it to our parents, it's like, excuse me, I'm still breathing, I'm still here. But in that culture, for you to do that would be to say, drop dead. Just drop dead, because that's when you get the inheritance. The younger son gets one piece, the older gets two, because he's the elder son. Father should take his left hand, not as important as your right, his left hand, not this way, but to slap his son this way. And if you have any strength behind you and you do that, they're gonna go rolling backwards and kick them out. That's what a father does. That is the culture of the time. There is no negotiation. There isn't anything else. And in the Middle East today, it is still true. You don't do these kinds of things. There's a high respect for your elders and for the father, but he would just smack him, but he doesn't do that. Here's the other thing he does, is he divides the inheritance. It doesn't say that he gave his younger son his, but he divides it between the two. Now in the culture, as long as you're living, even if that money's going to your sons, you get to use it, but not when a younger son takes it. The word uh, for what the son does with that, we'll look at more closely as we go forward, but we think about it in this way. The sheep was lost far off, right? Took off. Shepherd had to go and look for the sheep. The coin wasn't lost at the market. It wasn't lost when she went to the temple. It was lost in the home. They're both lost. That's the most important thing we can think of here, We're, is that the older son and the younger son are both lost, and Jesus wants them to get it, so that's why he begins with that story. So in the Old Testament, in keeping the law, you cannot come to the table with Gentiles, you cannot eat with sinners, um, you can't do any of that. And that's why when we come for communion, we begin to see this touch of grace that we hadn't seen before. That Jesus invites us as sinners. Jesus invites us as the Gentiles who have walked all the places we shouldn't walk, who have done all the things, who couldn't, why did we confess together? Because no matter how hard we try, we just can't quite keep that law in place. We have that need of redemption. This is a story about God's redemption, and he's not going to do anything that a father in that culture would do, and probably what we would do. So Jesus says, come to me, eat and taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen.
us turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Please join me. Lord, we come offering our thanksgiving and intercession. God, in your goodness, you have made a home for the worker, made a place in our hearts for compassion to the men and women who labor tirelessly for basic necessities. Ensure a place for all who are struggling to find work. Bring comfort and justice to those who are rejected in the work field for their gender, color, education, identity, or religion. Grant us your wisdom to greet and care for those who are unable to work due to illness or circumstances that pre prevent their participation. Lord, be with the children who are not able to run and play but instead must put in a hard day's work to help their family afford to eat, to live. Be with us all, Christ Jesus, as we go about the busyness of your work. Hold us accountable not only for our actions, but most importantly, to each of our neighbors. Holy God, we're grateful for your presence that transcends cultural, religious, economic, political, and social distancing, and calls us to do the same. We ask God for your peace in our hearts and minds as we discern how we might participate in your work. Equip us to offer our gifts and resources, not for a frenetic world of chaos, but for a world that would move according to the rhythm of your heart. We pray for our neighbors that serve at nearby restaurants and gas pumps, and neighbors whom we pass on the lanes of the local highways and the aisles of local grocery stores and streets. We pray that we might slow down enough to say good morning and thank you. Tell me your name. Hi, my name is, is Jan, and, and I'm happy to meet you. Help each of us do that, Lord. Help us to pause and see each person as a blessed child of God, all kinds, all shapes and sizes and abilities. Teach us how to preach against injustice, protest evil, protect the earth, and pray for the unfilling of your Holy Spirit that moves us to compassion and care. We pray for resolve and safety in Ukraine. Lord, may your healing touch and hands of justice move swiftly. We pray for presidents and all those in leadership around the world. We also pray for those affected by wildflowers, wildfires, for the families in South Africa whose loved ones died in the tragic fire that took 75 lives, for flooding and rains, for hurricanes looming, for all of life that keeps us from hearing your voice, come Holy Spirit. For all who in their labor now rest, united with you in the kingdom triumphant, may we live in that promise. Let us remember the labor of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has set before us his table, the extravagant, overwhelming, costly love. We remember that even as we once rejected your love, yet by your grace, unwarranted, unearned, you loved us to the end. May these elements we're about to take renew our trust and faith in you. We ask Lord Jesus, our Lord, who taught all of us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So scripture tells that each of us should give as we've decided in our heart, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. We have our budget, we have our special offerings, all of this we respond in giving because of what God has first given us. I invite the ushers, if you would please come forward at this time to receive our tithes and offerings.
abundance of our lives, we offer these gifts to you. Through your blessing and your willingness to share, may these offerings become a source for hope and love in this church family and in the community beyond us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be Before we begin the words of the institution, I want to say a couple of things. First is, there is in our little cause two sides. The smaller side is where the bread is. That is a well-kept secret for some people. So please note that the smaller side of this bread, you want to open that first and then the larger is the cup. We want you to um, have both the bread and the cup today. So just so you know this. So at this table, we acknowledge that the mystery is bigger than we are and that we want fellowship with this mystery. So come to the table. Those who have much faith and those whose faith is much less. Those who have been here often and those who have not been a while. Those who have tried to follow Jesus and those who have failed, come. Engage the mystery of God in community at this table. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Be with the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and having given thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Each time we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we remember Christ's saving death until it comes again. And so the gifts of God for the people of God come and taste and see that the Lord is good.
gives us life by sacrificing himself. Let us eat the bread of heaven today. Christ comes to each one of us individually, and yet calls us into community as a sign of both our faith as Christ our Lord, as our Savior, and the unity of the body. Let us drink this cup together. Pray with me, please. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in the sacrament, uniting us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal realm. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Yeah. Uh -huh. 